On Sunday, March 8th of this year, I laid the foundation for what was to be a new series on really a pivotal teaching of Jesus Christ, specifically on the Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5. However, due to the virus outbreak and the need to offer some messages associated with this pandemic, I've never been able to build upon this foundation or advance in this series as has been my desire. Um, in recent days, after a lot of consideration, I've realized that there's simply no way that I can meaningfully uh, pick up where we left off. And after the month and a half gap, I'm sure that it, for many in the sound of my voice who were present on March 8th, it's already begun to fade in your memory. And I'm sure that there are people who are tuning in today who were not even present on March 8th. So it's impossible for me to jump into part two, if you will, without properly establishing a part one. So for the, benefits, uh, for the benefit of those of you who were not here and really is a refresher, for those who were, it's my pleasure once again to lead you into one of Jesus' most timeless and timely of, of messages, and it's found in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. Please feel free to take just a second to turn there. If I can get some more monitor, hard to hear. Matthew 5 through 7 is a profound segment of Scripture containing what's commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount provides for us really a record of Jesus' teaching directed to those who've already chosen to follow him, wherein he touches upon really a dazzling array of topics in a very short amount of real estate. So if you want to understand and know the perspective of Jesus Christ on things like murder and hatred, adultery and lust, marriage and divorce, personal integrity and being a person of your word, themes of vengeance and love and giving and prayer and fasting, personal anxiety, worry, eternal reward, eternal punishment, and more, then the Sermon on the Mount is really a brilliant place to start. And the, the opening of what's called the Sermon on the Mount, verses 1 through 12 of Matthew 5, is called the Beatitudes. And I want to read this text with you in its entirety. We're going to read about 12 or so verses, and I want you to begin to spiritually digest what Jesus is saying to those crowds who had gathered nearly 2,000 years ago. Matthew 5, starting at verse 1. I'm reading from the NIV. It says the following. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. Now, his disciples came to him, those who were, who've already chosen, in a sense, out of the masses to be his followers, and he began to teach them, and he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Maybe this sounds familiar to you. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? For they will be filled. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And finally, verses 10 through 12, blessed are those who are persecuted. That sounds counterintuitive, but that's what Jesus said. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And what does he say in conclusion? Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, I want to begin to dissect this, break it down a little bit, and I want to begin by identifying the fact that even the most casual reading of this text, specifically verses 3 through 11, makes it clear that one of the most important words in this section is the word blessed. Now, if you go back in your own time and you look at how many times it appears, the sheer repetition of this one word in this text Nine times, I believe, in about nine or so verses should indicate that it's a significant word. And that significance is lost to us if we don't take the time to realize what that word means. So I want to begin this morning, again, kind of laying the foundation that I laid a few weeks ago. But again, many were not here, or I'm sure many have already forgotten. It's been a month and a half. 
what does the word blessed mean in the Beatitudes? Well, I want to begin to give you uh, some answers because when you dig into the text, you discover that there's really a, a nuanced meaning to this singular word. So for my note takers and the sound of my voice, point number one, blessed means happy or fortunate. Happy or fortunate. Now, we are not talking about some fleeting or earthly happiness or sense of good fortune, but an abiding, ongoing spiritual reality that is rooted in the person and in the promise of Jesus Christ. So we could, if we wanted to, read the Beatitudes in the following manner. And I want to go back now to verse 3. I'm not going to read them all, but I want to give you a sampling of how this would sound. An abiding happiness and fortune belongs to those who are poor in spirit. Verse 4, an abiding happiness and fortune belongs to those who mourn. Verse 5, an abiding happiness belongs to those who are meek. Skip down now to verse 10. An abiding happiness and fortune belongs to those who are persecuted because of righteousness or for righteousness sake. So when you begin to hear it through that filter, it begins to take on a certain degree of meaning. And I ask to you this morning the simple question, do you desire a life that is characterized not by a fleeting or temporal sense of happiness, but an abiding sense of happiness in fortune? If so, then take note of what Jesus says unlocks that the kind of characteristics, the kind of life, in a sense, that we have to, to pursue and lead if we want to experience that. Number two, beyond the word happy and fortunate, blessed also means favored. Now, again, very related, but there's a bit more of a different nuance to this. The underlying term for blessed carries the idea of commendation, not condemnation, but commendation which means that those who live in the manner that Christ described are and will be commended, rewarded, if you will, both in time and for eternity. So you could read the Beatitudes again like this. Let's go back to verse 3. Favored for both time and eternity are the poor in spirit. Verse 4. Favored for both time and eternity are those who mourn. Verse 8, we'll skip down a bit. Favored for both time and eternity are the pure in heart. Finally, verse 10. Favored, again, for time and eternity are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. There's a lot to that. But I ask you, do you want to live a life that is marked or characterized by the favor of God? Not just in this life, but in the life to come. If so, I call you again to take note of the lifestyle that Jesus is calling those who were his to live. And finally, point number three, beyond happy and fortunate and beyond favored, the term blessed also means enviable or to be envied. To be envied. So for the last time, allow some repetition. We could pick up verse three with the following. Enviable are the poor in spirit. Let's skip down to verse 6. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are to be envied. Those who are merciful, verse 7, are to be envied. Verse 9, the peacemakers are to be envied. Finally, verse 11, enviable are you when people insult you and persecute you and beyond. Now, when the Lord Jesus calls these things enviable, he's signaling that this is the type of life that we are to seek and to aspire to. This is the manner that we are to live as those who are his. Now, I have to identify that Jesus' teaching runs counter to so much of what we hear in this fallen world because the world will tell you that it's the rich and the powerful and the elite and the beautiful who are to be envied. They're the, types of, they're the types of people that we should aspire to be like, but the reality is this is not what Jesus says. Clearly, the valuation of Jesus differs greatly from the valuation of the world. So we have to daily navigate the fact that oftentimes Jesus' teaching is going to, re, to run counter to what we feel 
have been taught in beyond. And we're going to have to make a choice. Are we going to listen to what Jesus says, or are we going to allow culture or the world in beyond to influence us? But as I kind of conclude this point, do you desire to live a life that the Lord himself deems to be enviable, to be envied? If so, I invite you once again to consider what Jesus Christ had to say. Now, with the time that we have left, I want to begin to look at the opening two or so attributes of a godly life that Jesus says will bring about happiness, fortune, favor, and, in a sense, the life that is to be envied. And I want to begin with verse 3. So please look at verse 3 with me. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you'll indulge indulge me, we could read it in the following way. In abiding happiness in fortune belongs to those who were poor in spirit. Favored for both time and eternity are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit are to be envied. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So here's the opening question in a sense for this point. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? I want you to imagine that you're home, which you already are. Maybe you're on your own, you're doing some devotional time, you're reading throughout the week, and you come across this teaching, and you hear Jesus say, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that term or that phrase mean to you? How would you interpret that? How would you explain the meaning of this? I want your wheels to begin to go in that direction. And I'm going to help you out by giving some definition. To be poor in spirit is to recognize your utter spiritual bankruptcy before the Lord. I love that definition from one author. It is to recognize your utter spiritual bankruptcy before God. It's understanding that you have absolutely nothing of worth to offer him. And it's admitting that because of your sin, you are completely destitute and can do nothing to remedy the situation. There's a lot of meaning in those three words. That one small phrase captures a lot. And I love what one translation says. I believe it's the New Century Version. They are blessed who realize, who recognize, if you will, their spiritual poverty. I want you to keep your thumb in your Bible in Matthew chapter 5. And I want you to flip to the Gospel of Luke chapter 18. And maybe you're like me, and maybe you learn best by example. And I want to share with you an example of what spiritual poverty, poverty of spirit looks like. And I want to contrast it with an example of what it does not look like. So if you have a Bible at the ready at home, Luke 18. And I want to pick it up in verse 9. Now verse 9 introduces the context, if you will, in terms of why Jesus gives the following teaching. And I want you to take note of it. Luke 18, verse 9. Now, to some who were in the crowd, who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told the following parable. A few things. Number one, for those who maybe are new to Christianity, a parable is just a short story that's meant to illustrate a deep spiritual truth. Simple story meant to communicate something larger or complex. And who's the audience that he's specifically targeting? Those who were confident of their own righteousness. You know, I've lived in New England my entire life. And there is a culture, in a sense, that I've bumped up against in my entire Christian experience, especially among maybe the older generations, I'm going to say 35 and up, which I'm a part, I'm 41, that says, I'm good enough, that if I die, I'm certainly good enough to get to heaven because I'm a swell person. Well, if that's something you've ever felt, or if that's a mindset you've ever possessed, in a sense, Jesus is talking to you. Because he wants to expose some things and really a reality that that's anything but a poverty of spirit. Because being poor in spirit is the recognition that you can't save yourself. You can't fix yourself. Whatever the solution is to whatever ails us, it's not going to come from within you. It has to come ultimately from him. That's an important point. If you're at home this morning, it's 1110 at the time of this preaching, and you were convinced that when you die, you're going to get to heaven because of how good of a person you are, I please 
challenge you to reconsider in light of what Jesus is about to say. Verse 10, it says, two men, this is the story that he tells, went up to the temple, a place of prayer in a sense, to pray. Now, one was a Pharisee. Now, again, understanding the culture is important here because the Pharisees, they were the religious elite of the time that everybody looked up to. Everybody wanted to mimic the religiosity, if you will, the diligence of the Pharisees. So when Jesus told this story, people would have assumed that the Pharisee was the hero or the good guy of the story. Keep that in mind. And the other person in this text is a tax collector. They were the worst of the worst in ancient times. They were despised. You know, every, every civilization and culture has always had throwaway classes of people. In ancient Israel, people despised the tax collectors. So when the audience heard Jesus introduce two characters, they're operating from the assumption that the Pharisee is going to be the good guy, the tax collector is going to be the villain. Now watch what Jesus does. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed. If you want to learn how to pray, don't pray this prayer, by the way. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, people who are robbers and evildoers and adulterers, and I love this, or even like this tax collector. Now, I want you to imagine one day you come to church and someone next to you is worshiping, saying, God, I thank you that I'm not like this guy. Well, how would that make you feel? Worthless, judged, and beyond. But that's where the Pharisee is coming from. And now he begins in verse 12 to outline or elaborate upon his greatness. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all that I get. Nothing wrong with those things. But he's trusting in those things to, in a sense, save him. Verse 13, but the tax collector, this villain, if you will, stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Notice there's two men operating from two very different spiritual mindsets, offering two very different prayers. What's the conclusion? Jesus says it in verse 14. I tell you that this man, speaking of the tax collector, rather than the Pharisee, went home justified before God. In other words, only one of these two men received a sense of divine pardon in mercy and beyond. And Jesus concludes with this, For all who will exalt themselves, they will be humbled, and those who humble themselves, those who are willing to embrace a spirit of poverty in a sense, those who are willing to recognize that they can't exalt themselves, what's going to happen to them? They will be exalted. We see here a contrast of two figures, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Do you think at home the Pharisee was the one who's the hero of the story, who demonstrates poverty of spirit that leads to the kingdom of heaven? Absolutely not. It's the tax collector. It's the one who was broken before God, who recognized his need for mercy and forgiveness, who called out to God that received it. Maybe in the sound of my voice, you act a little bit more like the Pharisee. I challenge you to humble yourself before the Lord and to trust in him and in him alone for mercy. And maybe you're at home and you operate a little bit more from the perspective of the tax collector. And I've heard this many times, people will say, God, God would never want someone like me. God could never forgive someone like me. Well, what we see in this text, God is looking for someone just like you. He's willing to give you and grant you his mercy and his pardon if you're willing to humble yourself before him. So call out to the Lord. Whether you're a Pharisee or a tax collector, call out to him. Fall upon his mercy in practice this poverty of spirit, you'll find that it's a beautiful thing. I want to move on now as I begin to run a bit short on time. I want to look at verse 4 of Matthew chapter 5. I want to go back now to the Beatitudes. We've considered what it means to be poor in spirit and how those who are poor in spirit will inherit the kingdom of God. I want to look now at verse 4, and I want to spend the next 10 or so minutes as we begin to wrap things up unpacking its meaning. Blessed are those who mourn. 
Why? For they will be comforted. I'll say that one more time. If you're at home, maybe read it out loud with me. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. If you'll indulge me, this might say, an abiding happiness in sense of fortune belongs to those who mourn. You could also say favored for both time and eternity are those who mourn. You might also put it that those who mourn are to be envied. So I have to ask the question this morning, what does it mean to mourn? And I would say a little more specifically, what type of mourning is Christ referring to? And I want to really give you a two-fold answer to this question. The first is this, and I want to read a quote. The term here means to express deep grief. Now, in keeping with his theme of spiritual blessedness, Jesus seems to indicate that this mourning in verse 4 is due specifically to grief over sin. So if verse 3, in a sense, this idea of being poor in spirit introduces an idea, verse 4 completes it, in a sense. And I want to continue with what this author says. He has a brilliant insight. The mourning referred to here is that feeling, and that's the key word here, which the sense of our own spiritual poverty begets. And I'll explain that. Being poor in spirit it's really an intellectual mindset where you recognize at the head level and to a degree at the heart level that you are broken before God. We all are. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You might be a swell person compared to me or compared to others, that's fine. But we have all fallen short of God's glory. We are all ruined and we have to recognize that again at an intellectual level. But the sense of mourning here is, is the corresponding feeling of the heart, where you don't just recognize that you're broken before God, but you feel it. You, you have a feeling of the pain that we, that you, have caused him and others. You know, we often treat sin like it's a mistake, and I've, I've made this comment recently. You know, a mistake is forgetting where I park my car go into Walmart, do some shopping, come out, I have no idea where my car is. That's a mistake. But sin is something volitional. We choose to sin. We choose to lie. We choose to steal. We choose to lust. We choose to murder. And that choice, that criminal act, which is how the Bible describes sin, we have to realize that that grieves the Lord. That every time we sin, and I mean this, there is an element of God's heart that breaks. In the sound of my voice, have you ever been betrayed before by a friend, by, a, by one of your kids, by a spouse? I don't know. I want you to feel that sense of anguish, that, that sense of loss. What if that's what the Lord feels when we disobey him? And it is. I can point you to many places in Scripture that talk about the brokenness of God's heart when his children go the wrong way. Knowing that I've hurt the Lord, and I've certainly hurt others by my actions, that should produce a sense of grief in me for what I've done. So being poor in spirit, it's the recognition at the head level that I'm broken before God because of sin, but mourning in this text is that sense of emotion that comes along with it. And again, don't turn there for the sake of time, but I want to just kind of appeal back to the Luke 18 example that we just looked at for the, par for the parable of the, the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee stands before God, stands up tall, stands alone in a sense, and he brags before God of how wonderful he is. A, there's no poverty of spirit there because he's not operating to the truth or according to the truth that he's violated God's ways. And there's no corresponding sense of mourning either. In fact, he flaunts his goodness. But the tax collector demonstrates both of these beautifully. He demonstrates a poverty of spirit. You can see in his words that he understands he is bankrupt before God. But it's not just head knowledge. He feels it. It's evident even in his posture. He won't even look up to heaven. 
he feels the weight of what he has done. He beats his chest, kind of an old-fashioned way of expressing sorrow and grief. The only thing he can do is call out to God for a sense of mercy. Now, here's the beautiful thing. The person who's willing to do that will be freed from their guilt and shame so that they can go home justified before God. But before you can experience deliverance or release from that guilt and shame, we should probably first feel it. You know, we live in a generation we almost have no conscience now. Anything goes. Morality is now considered relative. Sleep with whoever you want. Drink whatever you want. Do whatever drug you desire. You have a child you don't want, kill it. That might sound harsh, but it's true. And we can do all of these things and not feel a thing. Again, it goes back to the fact we've lost a sense of poverty of spirit and we've lost a sense of mourning. We've lost that conscience in a sense. Now, the Lord wants to instill that back into us so that when we do the wrong thing, we should feel it. Now, I'm not calling you to live in a place of ongoing condemnation and guilt and shame, but guilt and shame can be helpful in that they drive you to find his mercy. This tax collector in Luke 18, he genuinely was in need of God's mercy, but he never would have appealed to it unless he first recognized and unless he first felt the weight of what he had done wrong. Think about that and allow that to begin to direct you toward the Lord who is so willing to forgive and to cleanse. Now for homework, if you will, I'll give you a text to read on your own. I think homework is good. Christianity shouldn't just be a Sunday morning affair in a sense. On your own, I want you to read through Psalm 51. And I'll give you just a little bit of context so that when you read it, you'll understand the background of it. There was an ancient king of Israel, for those who maybe don't know a whole lot about Scripture, and I welcome you if you don't. There was an ancient king of Israel called David. And David was a man after God's own heart. He was a faithful, godly man for the vast majority of his life. And because of that, because he was poor in spirit and beyond, God had exalted him to a place of power, prosperity, preeminence, and beyond. But at the height of his power, when everything was going well, David had a severe moral lapse. And he became guilty of adultery and murder. Now, when you read the account out of the book of 2 Samuel, you see David eventually come to his senses as the Lord begins to put his finger on some things through one of the ancient prophets named Nathan. And David in that text says, I have sinned. And God immediately forgives him. It's a beautiful story of God's mercy and grace. But sometime after, David on his own put pen to paper. And he wrote Psalm 51. And when you read that text on your own, I'm not going to read it to you this morning. If you can't find it, it's in my notes. Download my notes off of newlifebarry.org by Monday or Tuesday. I want you to read that because that psalm powerfully spells out the anguish that he felt for what he had done. And again, it drove him to seek the Lord. And here's the beauty. What does Jesus say? Blessed are those who mourn. Why? For they will be comforted. What kind of comfort will they experience? Well, in this context, the comfort of being released from guilt and shame. If you have been carrying the burdens of guilt and shame in the course of life, that's not a cross that the Lord has called you to carry. He's willing to take that thing off of your shoulders, but you have to recognize it and confess it and allow that feeling of brokenness to drive you to him. You will find, I promise you according to his promise, that he is a God who offers comfort to those who are willing to confess and recognize their waywardness. This morning I want to end with this, and it's kind of the part two, if you will, to mourning. Because I would be remiss if I didn't add the following. When I read Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, I can't help but feel that there is some promise of consolation for those who are his in those moments of deep anguish and sorrow. Many, Many in the sound of my voice, I am sure, 
if you have any years under your belt, you've had some moments of, of grief. You know what it means to suffer. Maybe even now, because of all the circumstances of our time, you're broken. Maybe you face some kind of a loss. We've lost about 30 to 40,000 people in our own country. In Massachusetts, about 1,300 people have passed away because of this virus. Maybe you are related to one of them. It's a brutal thing. Death is always so hard, especially when it comes so unexpectedly. Maybe in the sound of my voice, you, you lost a business through no fault of your own. You didn't run it into the ground because of mismanagement or, or make foolish choices. You were told that you couldn't open it. And because of that, and because there was no immediate aid to come to your aid, you've in a sense lost everything financially. You're wondering how you're going to put food on the table. You're looking to your kids and wondering what kind of future you can provide for them because there's no income right now. And the, the, the difficult thing is that there's no immediate end date in sight, so you're left in this place of limbo. Maybe you're in a place right now, as I speak, where you are mourning. You're experiencing grief. You know what it means to feel loss. I point you to Jesus. Because all these thousands of years later, he's still the one who gives comfort. Blessed are those who mourn. Why? Because comfort is available to them. And I call you this morning, run to it. Run to him. Embrace the comfort that he offers. Listen to the following. Psalm 34. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He might feel like he's a million miles away. And I've been there. I know what it means to cry alone at night, and you pray, and you feel like the prayers are bouncing off of the ceiling. But what does Scripture say? Beyond what I feel, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers them from them all. From all of them. I love what Job says, the lowly he sets on high and those who mourn are lifted to safety. Final reference, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all compassion and the God of all comfort, and I'll end with this, who comforts us in all our troubles. Do you have troubles this morning? I point you to the only one who can truly bring you comfort for both time and eternity. Do you desire a life that is characterized by an abiding sense of happiness and fortune? Do you desire a life that is marked with the favor of God? Do you desire a life, the kind of life that Jesus himself is enviable, called enviable, if so, I challenge you to begin to embrace the Beatitudes. And over the course of this week, begin to practice a sense of poverty of spirit. Confess your sin. Begin to, to tap into that feeling of grief over what you've done in your waywardness. Let that drive you to the one who gives you comfort. And if you're broken, run to him. You will find that he is able to make you whole. I want to close in a word of prayer, one or two brief updates, and I want to say thank you this morning for tuning in. Father in heaven, we recognize our need for you. Apart from you, we can do nothing. I personally, Lord, confess that I am bankrupt without you. There is nothing that I can do to fix myself or earn or merit your love. But I ask for your mercy, and I know that you're so faithful to give it. And I pray, Lord, that you would move those who are tuning in today to that same place of humility and brokenness before you, that they might find entrance into your kingdom and also the comfort that you so freely offer and provide. Be with us all, God. And we thank you for this opportunity to gather digitally, looking forward to that day that we can connect once again face to face. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If you're at home, I want to say thank you for tuning in. Lord bless you and keep you. Uh, Lord, move in your family. Provide for every need that you have. I want to say thank you to the many 
um, who can tr continue to contribute to this assembly and this work. Thank you for your giving. You can always feel free to give online at newlifeberry.org. I want to say special thanks as well to the team of people who were helping us with our weekday Monday through Friday lunch distribution as, we, as we're seeking to help those in our community and beyond. If you or a loved one have any needs at this time, please don't hesitate to give me a call or shoot me an email or a message of some kind. I'd love to speak with you. And if I can be of any assistance to you or if this body can be of any help to you in your walk with the Lord or in living this life before him, please give me a call. I'd love to hear from you. God bless you. We really hope to see you in person once again very, very soon.